You've had your coffee, I can tell. Do you know, I have another mic on so I can do this. I, I actually am not one of those give a speech walking around the stage kind of people, I wish, but I'm not. But I didn't want to stand over here at the podium because the whole point of being together with 7,000 friends is to have a conversation with each other. But here I am on stage all alone, and that's not going to work. So Joanne, would you come back out? I had the idea that Joanne and I would have a, a conversation. That's why we have, that's your chair. That's why I asked for two chairs. And Joanne, sit down, get comfortable. Joanne and I are going to have a conversation. She's going to ask me questions, which I have taken the liberty of writing. <laughs> OK. So let's get started. OK. Jane, don't you have a birthday coming up pretty soon? Do I have a birthday? Well, I do indeed. Um, anybody else have a Halloween birthday? Yeah. Yeah, nine months after Valentine's Day, I think. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to be 64. Okay. Thank you. Next question. You look great. <laughs> Doesn't she look great? <laughs> oh, well. Well, you know, we baby boomers kind of owe a debt of gratitude to St. Sarah Blakely, a Gen Xer. Do you know who Sarah is? She invented your Spanx. <laughs> but that's not, all, that's not all the story. One of the uh, uh, stories in my book, Your Life Calling, Reimagining the Rest of Your Life, was a guy. Uh, Richard Luker is a... Um, uh, an expert, probably America's foremost expert in how America's, Americans use their leisure time and recreation. And the story about him in the book is that, uh, ironically, there was no recreation in his life. And how he uh, discovered a base softball team and joined it and found balance. But Richard Luker, being the expert that he is, has data uh, that shows putting on my reading glasses, this happens at 42, uh, <laughs> uh, that people in their 50s today are far more vital in their outlook and more active than people 50 years old and 10 years ago. This is a movement. It is a, it is a, is a different world, just a different world, and that's quoting I got ahead of myself. Go ahead. When does the future start? The future started whenever, do you remember when you made reservations to come here and this event was in the future? The future comes very rapidly. I heard Alan Alda uh, tell a story just a week ago on a, a panel discussion. He's kind of a science guy, you know? He's an actor, but he likes science, and he said that Scientists have defined the length of the word now. And you're thinking, yeah, three letters. No, the length of now has been determined to be about five seconds. So the question that you ask me was in the past. The present is about five seconds, so the future is pretty much right now. And at the end of our conversation, and I'm keeping my eye on a clock, we're all going to head off into the future together. We're going to go through those doors. You see the big doors marked exit? Exit used to be what retirement was. And retirement used to happen when someone was about, oh, 65, which is next year for me. I've just started a new job at CBS, after 40 years at NBC, CBS Sunday morning. No gener... Well, <laughs> everybody loves Charlie Osgood, who is 82, but who starts a job 
at 63. A generation ago, that would have been inconceivable. Now it's no big whoop. It's a different world. I interviewed Meryl Streep. Actually, I shared a stage with Meryl Streep. Uh, it was like this. <laughs> I was asking the questions. And she told a story that made an audience of about this size gasp. She asked, how old do you think Betty Davis was when she starred as a way over the hill actress in All About Eve? 40. As Meryl put it, as she did that thing she does with her hair. So it's really a different world. It is really a different world. Oh, what could it be? <laughs> Not everyone is as comfortable with change as you are. Is it OK to be scared a little? Yeah. Yeah. The future is kind of an unknown. Um, it, uh, it, you can plan for it, but it, it is kind of scary. And, and I'm not, I'm not by nature an optimist. I'm not a pessimist, like my husband will say. A pessimist kind of has a vested interest, a stake in, in the worst possible outcome. I'm not that person. But I do like to keep an eye on the, on the horizon for the worst case scenario. I like to be uh, prepared. I don't like bad surprises. Uh, but in my, my book, which is about the future, and the reality is we are going to live a lot longer than we're thinking we're going to live, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, everybody here knows someone who lived to be in their 90s and possibly robust years into their 90s or even triple digits. Our parents and grandparents didn't know that many people. More of us are living longer. They now don't, don't talk merely about longevity. They talk about a longer health expectancy. This is a new phase of life, and it's on us how we fill those years. And I, for one, don't know how many healthy years I had of ahead of me, but I don't want to squander uh, the, the ones I have. So my book is about the future, but I try to dispel some misconceptions, though it's not a how-to book, but the misconceptions that there's some perfect you waiting to be discovered. You have many persons inside of you. All of them want, to quote an expert in my book, a little airtime, holding out for that perfect someone is paralyzing, as is the idea that at this stage of life, you got to get it right the first time. No, it's all about trial and error. I'm frankly proud of the things that, including something that you mentioned before, that, 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 that frankly were failures. The courage to do something makes me proud. And I'm at an age in, in life and this is biological, and many of you are going to nod your head knowingly. There was a story in the newspaper just this week, though the story was already in my book. A bar graph that charts life satisfaction. The worst decade are the 30s. No worries, you still get to be great looking. But face it, you've got young children, you're starting careers, you're trying to juggle, you're, it, it, it was hard to get here. Maybe some 30-somethings didn't get here because there's too much going on. So the 30s, not so great. But this bar graph in the newspaper, maybe you saw it, showed that around the age of 40, it started ticking up again, life satisfaction. And the 50s, a little higher. The 60s, higher still. The highest bar in this chart of wellness and satisfaction was 65 and up. It's a biological development. It's true all around the world, rich and poor, men and women. We are making, by we I mean those of us in the cool 60s, are making getting older look aspirational. Um, I also would like to just 
dispel the misconception that you have to just follow a passion. Lucky you if you got one. I don't even have hobbies. Does a person without hobbies have a passion? Probably not. So, putting that aside, or well, don't let me do all the talking, Joanne has questions. <laughs> What is the best advice you ever got? The best advice? Well, one morning, about three years after the end of the daytime show that I'm frankly surprised that you referenced because I've noticed <laughs> that when I'm introduced, a lot of people skip over that part. You remember the Jane Pauley show? No, 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 not so much. <laughs> <laughs> what you do remember is the year Oprah gave everybody in her studio audience a new car. <laughs> that was the week the Jane Pauley show debuted. <laughs> I think my audience went, went home with either soap or a toothbrush or something. Hardest year of my life, but the best. I took a big risk. I told my kids before I started, I knew it was a long shot, they'd heard of Oprah, but I said, I define success as having the courage to say yes, to try something hard. And by that definition alone, the Jane Pauley show was a big success. But one morning, <laughs> one morning, about three years later, when people had stopped asking me, what are you up to these days, Jane, and had transitioned to, how are you enjoying retirement, I got an email in my inbox. It began, dear mom, it was from my son Tom, then about 23 or 4. I'll sum up. He said, it's time to make your move. Um, he said, it's, you've surveyed the field long enough, looking for what you might want to do, what you might be good at. It's time to get something going and make something happen. He was absolutely right. You know, one thing in my book is not about advice. But here's a big piece of advice. In the 37 stories I did in the Your Life Calling series on the Today Show with my partners then at AARP, I noticed a theme that so many of the people whose lives I profile and you will find inspirational were serial volunteers, including a woman from Philadelphia who I think is here Barbara, stand up and wave your arms around. Barbara Chandler Allen. Call out to me, Barbara. Oh, come on. Barbara Allen started a nonprofit here in, and I know she's here. Barbara started an organization in Philadelphia called Fresh Artists that you should know more about. And I think next year at the conference, Barbara should be one of the guests. She's a dynamic woman. Look up Fresh Artist, Google it, we don't have time. Uh, but as Barbara said to me, she says, Jane, and she'd been a stay-at-home mom for some 20 years here in Philadelphia, uh, but she said, I'd always been a pretty confident person, but in my 60s, it's reached terrifying proportions. <laughs> Who is Doug Smith? Who is Doug Smith? I don't know Doug Smith. When I went on a book tour in January, and as I said, I didn't have hobbies, and I didn't have a passion, and I didn't, I wasn't someone who was a learner. Um, uh, I didn't have any of the qualifications that seemed to describe so many of the people I profiled. And someone told me about a man named Doug Smith and handed me his research on happiness. I still don't know the man. But I'll read this to you. He says, having researched happiness, whatever challenges happy people have faced, 
and mistakes that they have made, they have learned from them and let them go. They have confidence about the future. They plan for the future, but realize they can't control it. They face the future feeling whatever comes their way, they'll figure out how to deal with it. And this is especially true of people who reach the age of 64 have had some life experience, good and bad. Now with peace, at peace with the past and with confidence in the future, Doug Smith concludes, they are able to live in the present where joy is primarily found. And that describes me. A final thought which is all we have time for. <laughs> if there is a theme to my book, Your Life Calling, I found it in a newspaper, a newspaper article. I, I, I say in the book that the newspaper in the morning is filled with ideas. My husband comes down after me, and he finds the newspaper filled with holes as I rip stories out and save them. I've been doing this for 20 years. I first used the word reinvention in a speech in 1989 when I was 38. That wasn't my happiest decade. <laughs> it got better. But I found a story in the Washington Post. I don't remember what it said. It was the headline. This headline sums it up for me. Inspiration is everywhere, but you have to be looking. I think it's fair to say that 7,000 women and some men who came to the Pennsylvania Women's Conference this morning were looking for something. You may not know what you're looking for, but you'll find it because you came out this morning to be with other interesting women, to hear other interesting speakers, to learn new things. Inspiration is everywhere, but you have to be looking and I hope you find it everywhere you look. Thank you for your time, and have a great day. And thank you, Joanne. Thanks so much.